Good morning and happy Easter. Welcome to Paso Grove Beach Community Church, United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcomed here. A special day it is. It is a day for you to scoot in your seat and make room for someone else. It's a day for you to maybe sit in the very front row because it's all empty. Or, or maybe it's a day to come and sit on the chapel side. Um, but for those of you who are looking for uh, places to sit, we do have a lot right here in the front and over on the chapel side. And uh, for those of you who are in pews with um, extra space, you know, let them know that, that it's, it's safe to sit next to you. So because of our location, we are, have been described as a little corner of paradise. Our community is made up of people who come from all parts of the world, all corners of our nation, and then from all sorts of diverse traditions. People come that are runaway Catholics. People come who are uh, um, hiding from the Presbyterian Church. The frozen chosen. And of course, we get from just every other visitor that's just this curious and interested as to how it is that we do Easter here on Pastor Grove Beach. And so on behalf of, of this church, I want to let you know that everyone is welcome, regardless of your tradition, regardless of your station in life, regardless of um, your upbringing. Everyone is welcome. We are an open and affirming church and um, want to let you know that that also is very important. As far as announcements go, I just very quickly want to say that a lot is happening in the life of this church, and you could f find out um, through by visiting our website. Our website is uh, PAG Church, www.pag Church, and um, it has announcements of everything that's going on between now and summer, including um, a, a series that's, that's going to be uh, coming in the next six weeks. And so having said all that, I want you all to take a nice deep breath, relax, take it all in, know that Easter is here. Christ is risen. Okay. And before moving on, we do have an announcement as excited as we all are for Easter. And boy, the choir has been working extra hard. We got special music and so forth. We're also very excited for what happens after Easter. Uh, first of all, next Sunday is National Senior Minister Let's the Associate Minister Preach Sunday. <laughs> Guillermo will be preaching, uh, I'll be assisting. Uh, next, next week we'll be preaching a very powerful message, so uh, I hope you'll come back and hear uh, Guillermo uh, preach. And then uh, after that Sunday, we'll be starting a six-part series called the Fa Living the Faith of Jesus in a Pluralistic worlds. How can we, look, we'll be exploring, how can we as Christians embrace and walk fully the path of Jesus without denying the legitimacy of other paths that God may create uh, for humanity? Now many people uh, you know, turn to uh, what Jesus says in, in uh, the 14th chapter of John to say, well, wait a minute, didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes unto the Father except through me. I'm overlooking the fact that just a few chapters earlier, he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. So, Jesus wasn't preaching that it's either Christian's way or the hell way. He was preaching about a way of life that connects us to God. He wasn't just simply saying, hey, anyway, it doesn't matter. But there's a specific way of life that connects us to the divine that we're going to be exploring in, the, in the, that six-week series and it's a way of life that is also reflected in some of the world's great traditions. And the more we as Christians then uh, focus on our own unique gifts as Christians, the more we can then claim those gifts that, that we offer the world specifically as Christians. And we can also, the more we listen to other people of other faiths, the more we actually learn how to be a deeper and more faithful follower of Jesus Christ uh, himself. It does not water down our faith to say that we're not the only faith on the planet. It actually ratchets it up and makes it quite joyous indeed. So I hope you'll join us for six weeks exploring that, really six weeks of joy uh, that will follow uh, uh, next week. Thanks.
So do you know why? Do you know, do you know why, there's so much echo in there. <laughs> uh, do you know why uh, Christians typically offer a passing of the peace at the beginning of worship on Sunday mornings? Well, every Sunday is uh, actually in the tradition a celebration of Easter. That's why the 40 days of Advent, I mean, of Lent rather, don't include Sundays. Uh, it's because Sunday, we, we honor Easter already, every Sunday. And if you put up the slides instead of the, the video uh, now, uh, it actually, the origin of passing the peace comes from the Gospel of John, the, uh, a part of the Easter account. If you put up the slides instead of the video, okay. Pardon our technical difficulties. Okay, there we go. There we go. No, that's not it. Can, can you put it back to the, uh, the passing of the peace? Okay, I'll just tell you <laughs> about that. Make it, make it easy. It's because uh, on Easter morning when Jesus uh, eventually appears to uh, the disciples, uh, the first thing he says is peace be with you. And then, you know, they, they, they realize, why, my gosh, he's, he's there, and, he, and then he breathes on them. Uh, and then once again, he says, peace be with you. So at the beginning of worship, we pass the peace of Christ to one another. I'm going to invite all who are able to stand and join me in let us pass, let's pass the peace of Christ to one another. We're a little bit confused. We uh, went out of order from our normal worship uh, this morning, so uh, let us join together in our call to worship. Christ is risen. God's steadfast love endures forever. Death has lost its sting. God's steadfast love endures forever. Rejoice in this day of salvation. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, gasping for breath. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left immediately for the tomb. They ran neck and neck. The other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter, stooping to look in. He saw all the pieces of linen and cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him, entering through the tomb, and he observed the linen cloths lying there, and the kerchief used to cover his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but separate, neatly folded by itself. Then the other disciple, the one who had gotten there first, went into the tomb, took one look at the evidence and believed. No one yet knew from the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The disciples went back home. Please rise as you're able and let us join our voices together in singing Christ the Lord is risen today.
And because peace has already come early to Pasa Grill Beach Community Church, let us continue our worship with our morning anthem. According to John, Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she knelt to look into the tomb and she saw two angels sitting there dressed in white, one at the head, the other at the foot where Jesus' body had been laid. They said to her, woman, why do you weep? They took my master, she said, and I don't know where they put him. After she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, Woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Sir, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I could care for him. And Jesus said, Mary. Turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, meaning teacher. And Jesus said, Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. 
Mary Magdalene went, telling the news to the disciples. I saw the master. And she told them everything that he, that he said to her. Here ends his reading, and we ask for God's blessings upon it. And will you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So are you as curious as I am about why Jesus, the risen Christ, on Easter morning would first appear to Mary Magdalene, whom he dearly loved, as a gardener? I mean, you might expect him to appear as, well, uh, Jesus? I mean, has Jesus confused Easter with Halloween or what? And this isn't the only time in the Gospels where the risen Christ appears as something other than Jesus at the 6.30 uh, sunrise service. If you were up for that, we, did, we looked at another account, Luke's account, where two of the disciples, not one of the twelve, but two Jesus followers, are walking back dejectedly to Emmaus after the crucifixion, and on the third day they're walking back, and then this random traveler shows up and asks them, you know, what are you talking about? And it turns out that you know, they, they don't recognize him until finally when they're making the turn off to Emmaus, they encourage this random traveler to come and join them for the night in their home, and, and he does, and that's when it's revealed in the breaking of the bread at dinner time that, oh my gosh, it's the, the risen Christ. So there's two, two occurrences where Jesus first appears as someone other than what we would expect uh, to find him as. Um, so uh, here and at that random traveler on the walk to Emmaus, uh, what is going on? Is, you know, is Jesus? I doubt Jesus is confused about the holiday. Uh, in fact, in my experience, Whenever Jesus does something confusing, I've learned uh, the hard way to, to realize that Jesus is not the one who's confused, it's moi. I'm the one who's, who's confused. I need to sit with this a little bit, figure out you know, what was he intending uh, through this unusual act, whatever it is. And, you know, I have a, a theory. Um, don't, I don't claim to have divine uh, knowledge to this, but my theory is one reason why he's appearing as a gardener to, to Mary is because he's, he's having a little fun with, with Mary. Now, I mean, let's allow Jesus to have a little fun on his own resurrection day, all right? I mean, Jesus actually, his, his humor is often overlooked in, in the Gospels, but it's there if you know how to find it. Like, for instance, remember that time that, 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 that disciples see Jesus walking on the water and that Peter tries to and Simon. Simon Peter comes out and tries to walk on the water. He sinks like a rock, right? Well, it's just a few breaths later that Jesus has pulled the disciples aside and says, you know, Simon, I've got a new name for you. Let's, from now on, we're going to call you Peter, which means rock. <laughs> After we just sank like a rock to see it down there. I mean, come on. <laughs> you can just hear the disciples just bursting out with laughter. You know, that Jesus had a sense of humor, a sense of, of joy, because he's so full of God's love and grace. And just picture yourself, if you were in Jesus' sandals, and the last thing you experienced, and part of your normal earthly life, is that you've just been beaten and tortured, and you've been hung in, hanging on a cross for several hours, until finally your consciousness goes, oh. And the next thing you experience, is your consciousness going? No blood. No pain. Whoa! 10,000 times greater awareness of everything. This human brain has been filtering out so much of reality. It's now no longer filtering anything out. The spiritual power, the sense of oneness with the divine and, and the love and the grace that's, that surrounds each and every one of us all the time. He's feeling no pain. He's feeling his powers. My gosh, he could morph into anything he, he just simply intends to morph into. Oh, there's Mary, the one I love so much. Oh, oh, will she be surprised? <laughs> now, I don't know whether he's really poking a little fun before the big reveal or not. But what's clear to me is whether or not he's poking, having a little fun with Mary, Jesus is certainly having a little fun 
with us in the way this account transpires, the, the, the events. It is almost as if Jesus has hidden an Easter egg in his own Easter story and is just daring us to try to open it to reveal the prize inside. Why? Why is he a gardener? Why? Why is that? We gotta figure it out. He's given, but he does give us a clue into how to open this particular egg. He actually gives it in the very first statement he makes to Mary Magdalene when he appears as a gardener. Remember the question he asks? Is, arguably, this is one of the stupidest questions asked in all of Scripture. What are you looking for? Who did he think he which Mary Magdalene was looking for on Easter morning when the tomb is empty and the body's gone? The Easter Bunny? Of course, Jesus knew full well who he, she's looking for. But wait. Have you heard that question out of Jesus' mouth before? If you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you have heard it before in a very significant place. These are the very first words out of his mouth in the entire Gospel of John. These very words. Do you find it interesting that the very first words out of his mouth in John's Gospel are exactly the same as the first words out of his mouth when he's resurrected? Maybe we should explore that first story. So John the Baptist is standing on the, uh, near this, the Jordan River with some disciples and Jesus comes walking by and John the Baptist is like, he's got this, like he senses like, whoa, this is a person of huge spiritual you know, significance. And he points to his disciples to Jesus and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Next day, Jesus, and John is standing with the disciples again, and Jesus again shows up and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, those two of his disciples, one of whom is Andrew, the brother of Peter, both of whom will eventually become disciples of Jesus, they're like, Well, man, we want to check this guy out. You know, and so they come over to this Lamb of God, and as soon as they approach him, Jesus turns around and he asks them, who are you looking for? There seems to be a connection between the Lamb of God and the garden. It's the exact same question. And in case you missed the connection, there's something else. How do these disciples respond? As soon as he asks, who are you looking for? They take a look at his face. They say, Rabbi! means my master. Oh, that's the exact same word that Mary exclaims when Jesus asks him, who are you looking for? She suddenly is like, whoa! She's, now she's using Aramaic rather than Hebrew. Rabboni means the same thing. My master. Ha! Huh. So, mystery solved. Egg can open. The lamb of God is the gardener of God. <laughs> ah, can't quite open it yet, but maybe we're getting closer. As with any great mystery of Jesus, one mystery opens up to another level of mystery. So there's this tight connection between the Lamb of God and the gardener of God. So what does it mean to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Well, in the Christian tradition and the Jewish one, there's a, a sacrificial lamb takes a prominent role in, in both traditions. The, the Christian actually springing from the original Jewish tradition. You may recall uh, that, that you know, for the last 3,000 years, Jews have celebrated uh, a, a holiday that takes place around now called Passover. And a Passover Seder dinner is, is offered in which they serve lamb or a symbolic representation of lamb, like a lamb shank. We put that on the Seder dinner plate. Why? Because there's a story that's central to Jewish identity that, that, that this is reminding them of. That is, from when they were in Egypt, remember back in the book of Exodus, they, the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt for 400 long years. And 
Finally, uh, God, through Moses, uh, demands to Pharaoh, let my people go. And doesn't count on Pharaoh just taking Moses' word for it, but actually every one, he warns uh, Pharaoh nine times through Moses to let the people go and accompanies this with some dramatic miracle to make sure that he knows this is not just Moses talking. Uh, Pharaoh ignores all the warnings, all the signs, refuses to let the people go. So finally, uh, God pulls what might be called the nuclear option. Um, he's, um, instructs, God instructs Moses to tell the people, the Jewish people, hey, uh, something's coming. Uh, God is going, just like the, the Egyptian people once came through and they killed all the firstborn of the Egyptian uh, uh, children, um, the spirit is going to come and kill the firstborn of the Egyptians as a sign to let us go. But if you will slaughter a lamb and paint, paint the, uh, take some blood and paint it on the doorposts of your home and the lintels, the spirit will pass over you and go to the Egyptian houses. Now, this story admittedly is a little bit violent and maybe not prevalent of, of God to leave have come to know in Jesus Christ. That some scholars believe that this story, you will say, you know, actually never happened that way. It was part of the mythological imagination of, of the people, meaning it was, the story isn't meant to describe events that took place 3,000 years ago in a historical way, the way we know, the way we know history, but rather the story, though, tells truth because what it's doing is talking about the way things are that happen over and over and over again on up to our present day. So it's actually more true than history. Whether it's history or not, or, or, or metaphorical, it's speaking of some truth that's central to the Jewish people, which is that the God we worship liberates oppressed people. And that when you've given up all hope, you think you know, there is no way forward, God makes a way. That's central to their tradition. Came out of slavery. God is a liberator of physical slaves, spiritual slaves, and, and, and it's dramatic. So they celebrate Passover every year in the slaughtering of, of the lamb uh, there. Well, we know that during Holy Week, Jesus' Last Supper, which we commemorated on Monday, Thursday of this last week, it was a Passover Seder. Jesus instructs his disciples to gather the elements for the Passover. And actually, if you read closely the narrative, he's actually following first century Passover uh, uh, Seder uh, Supper liturgy. But in this liturgy, he, he does something dramatic that was completely unexpected. He replaces the Passover lamb with himself. Now, this lamb is mighty important for the meal. I mean, if, in Jerusalem during his day, so many lambs were, were slaughtered to celebrate the Passover lamb. Because people came from all over to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. That literally, if you walk on the Temple Mount to this day, you will see holes in the, in the, uh, the stones that were drilled out um, all over the, the plaza. And these were the places where the, the people brought lambs to the priests and the holes. Uh, there was so much blood flowing, the holes actually flooded the blood out of the temple square. That's how important these lambs were. By the way, they, they were normally sacrificed special lambs on Passover. They were lambs that came from a little town just a couple miles outside of Jerusalem called Bethlehem. Now, there's somebody famous who said they were born young, and I can't remember who it was, but anyway, that's <laughs> made, made an interesting connection, uh, too, that the, the, the sacrificial lambs came from Bethlehem, they were especially raised for that purpose. So, there's apparently no lamb, though, at the Passover Seder Supper of Jesus, because he replaced the lamb with his self. Indicated in his words, we taste bread and he breaks the bread, and says, my friends, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. So likewise, after supper, he gives thanks and holds up the Savior cup. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Well, surely the disciples must have been confused like why Jesus is replacing the lamb with himself. But certainly, they, things came to clarity on Good Friday when this particular Passover lamb then his blood is shed, shed on a cross. And suddenly it's got a, a thing to people, a dramatic reinterpretation of 
this whole Passover really is a Jewish identity. Because if you remember the story, in the old story, the violent story, they paid the blood of the lamb. Whoever shed the blood of the lamb, they were protected. The spirit passed over the innocent Hebrew slaves and slaughtered the guilty Egyptians, or at least they're, I don't know how guilty those children were. But you slaughtered that the idea was the innocent are protected, the guilty are, are punished or are slaughtered. But who is shedding this lamb's blood? Not the faithful innocents. Not the true believers. In fact, the very poor people are shedding this lamb's blood by the very people who do not believe in Jesus, who mocked him, tortured him, and are now laid him to the cross. And if the blood of this lamb is causing a great Passover, what a Passover indeed. Christians have begun to sink in. Wait a minute. Is he forgiving the sins of those in his own crucifixion? Well, in case you missed it, his, Jesus is all pointing. In fact, his disciples missed it. He says so much in the Gospel of Luke when he's hanging there on the cross. What does he pray? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If, if God's loving grace could actually come upon the very people who crucified. God's own Son, God's own chosen Messiah. Who couldn't or wouldn't God's love and grace come to? It is no coincidence that for the first three centuries of Christianity, most Christians were, had an understanding of universal salvation. That is, apparently everybody gets in there. Apparently Jesus did this for everyone, because if Jesus did this for those who crucified him, not just true believers, surely this is for, there is no one that would be outside of God's love and grace. For the first three centuries, most Christians were universalists. Not all of them, when you know, Christianity has never been 100% uniform on anything. You put 100 Christians in the room, you get 110 opinions, right? But most Christians believe that what Jesus did on the cross was for all of us, we are all already saved. The, the war has been won. Now the battles are being cleaned up. That is, we, there's still plenty of hell to deal with in this life, the way we treat each other. So now we will treat each other as if God loves you, and, or God loves non-believers, even persecutors, even your enemies, like God loves you. You will treat them differently. And I think it's no wonder that the, actually the entire Roman Empire converted to Christianity, and there is not one record to my knowledge, not one record, my research this, not one record of any Christian ever raising a sword against the very Romans who were persecuting them blood, in bloodthirsty ways, in torturous ways, over and over again. Not one Christian raised a sword against the Roman Empire. Yet the entire Roman Empire then became converted because the faith was so attractive. The Romans literally couldn't kill enough Christians to keep up with all the converts. After Christianity becomes the religion of the empire, things begin to change. People begin to wonder, well, maybe is it only Christians who get it and other people don't, and so forth. Um, and, but yet, it's worth noting to this day, even though many people believe that only Christians get in, there's been a strain of Christianity, strains of Christianity, who have always believed that what Jesus did on the cross is for everybody. For instance, the Armenian apostolic uh, tradition, which is one of the oldest Christian traditions anywhere in the world, most people continue to hold this view. Same thing with those early Christian, Celtic, Celtic Christians, which continued on into the, the last century. But when they moved into this century, most of them had a universal sense of salvation. And even in our United Church of Christ, which has congregationalist roots, a great number of congregationalists were Christian universalists. I mean, it's all for everyone. Paul himself uh, seems to have had this view. Paul thought it was extremely important that you believe in Jesus, but not to, uh, not to get you out of hell. In fact, nowhere, if you read every letter in the New Testament that is authored by Paul, and that's the majority of the New Testament, there, and you count how many times Paul uses the word hell, it's zero. Where Paul, why would you talk about hell if it's Jesus smashed its gates? Paul did believe there's plenty of hell that we, that we have to deal with in our own life until we accept the love of grace given to us and learn to give it to others. We'll experience plenty of 
But ultimately, when push comes to shove, Paul says, nobody, nobody is, is, is asking for this love and grace. And he, and he puts this in writing. I'm not just making this stuff up, right? Here's Romans 8. Do you think that anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not hopelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins in Scripture. None of this faces us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love for us because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. No, in this life we will experience plenty of hell in the way we treat each other or treat our treated by until we learn to fully accept the grace and love that has come to us. It's already been given to us while we are yet in this life. Before we ever came to believe, it's already done for us. When we really start sinking in, it will absolutely change the life. Turn all hatred into love. Turn conflict into peace. Turn shame into empowerment and glory. Now, before moving on, we're going to explore now how this Lamb of God and the Garter of God come together and open this end. But before we get there, we're going to experience what that connection is more deeply. But we'll just take a couple moments as music plays. And just consider your own life. Have you yet accepted the love and the grace of God to be Smashing all the barriers between you and God. And if you haven't, we just consider how your life might change, how the world might change, if we should simply accept this love, and then learn to give the same love to others as we have the God said is given to us. So the gardener, the gardener. What could be the significance that this Lamb of God, which is now in the background of who this gardener is, what could it mean? What could this gardener really signify? Well, the actual clue is in the fact that he's a gardener. Can you tell me, who, aside from Jesus, who is the most famous gardener in all the Bible? 
Hmm. Let me give you a hint. And the Lord, from Genesis 2, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there God put the man, in Hebrew that means Adam, whom he had formed to till and keep it. Yes, Adam is the, the most famous gardener aside from Jesus in the whole Bible. And you know the story of Adam and Eve, I'm, I'm guessing. They, they were put in the garden and then there are two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the knowledge, uh, the knowledge of good and evil and another tree, the tree of life. And Now, whether you think this story took place historically uh, or metaphorically, it really doesn't matter. It, it, the story tells us about what goes on and on in our, you know, up to the present day. It's, it's one of those deep truth stories about describing our relationship between ourselves and God, ourselves and each other, and ourselves and the earth. So they eat, they, they're told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They eat the fruit, and then they are, are ushered out of the garden uh, to, to live then. And in this sinful state then for disobeying. And now people think that they are, you know, and God puts up these like, like angels with flaming swords at the gate of the garden so they can never come back because God says, you know, lest they eat from the tree, tree of the fruit of, of eternal life, uh, we, we can't let them stay in the garden. Now most people think that they're being punished by being ushered out of the, of the garden. But actually, if you ask me, it's a protection mechanism. Uh, I mean, why would God want us to lock in our sinful state for eternity? That would truly damn us. And so by, by, by the story indicating that we've been ushered out of the garden, away from access to eternal life, our sinful state does not get locked in. Meaning there is nothing we can do on this earth that will have, that, that, that will have eternal consequences for us. There are plenty of consequences in the here and now, and certainly we experience those consequences when we mistreat each other and are mistreated by others. Plenty of consequences now, but none of these things have eternal uh, consequences. Uh, and so identifying Jesus with Adam, like, wait a minute, didn't original sin come from Adam, so why would Jesus uh, you know, uh, be appearing as this sinful person? Well... The early church understood the connection here. Let's uh, once again hear from the Apostle Paul, who articulates well the understanding of, in John's Gospel and that of the early church that Jesus is not the first Adam. He's Adam 1.0. He's Adam 2.0. He is the second Adam. Paul says, For if the many died through the one man's trespass, that is first Adam, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many, second Adam. Just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, first Adam, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all, second Adam. For just as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, first Adam, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous, second Adam. And Paul's understanding and the understanding of the church, the first Adam put us on a path of destruction, second Adam broke free from that path and created a new way, the path of redemption, broke even the, the, that gate in the garden that prevented us from tasting the first fruits from the tree of life itself. So, the person who's standing there, really you see the message is the same whether you consider him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world or the second Adam, he's both and both bear the same exact message. That God's love and grace as we know in Christ covers up all our sins, has taken down the gates of hell has taken down the gate of the garden itself. And the invitation is to taste the sweetness of eternal life when we fully accept this love and grace for ourselves and we learn to give it to others just as freely as we have received it. So, now, now, we're ready, I think, to open 
this egg and see what's inside. Oh, of course. You may wonder, like if the second Adam is here, is there a second Eve? I mean, the story isn't really competitive. Adam and Eve got second Adam, but what about second Eve? Second Eve, represented by Mary Magdalene, is really us. It's us. Why do you think that there, Jesus preaches so many parables of a bridegroom who's awaiting his bride? Why do you think Jesus preached that parable we covered a few weeks ago where like all the people around are invited to this huge wedding feast, the good and the bad alike, it says, and they all are given wedding gowns. The only one who's, who's excluded from the party is the one who refuses to put it on. They are all become the brides. What's inside this egg is a wedding ring. This one made of candy, but I suspect the real one is made of purest gold. No, the early church saw it clearly that they believed that the church itself is the bride of Christ. Anyone who accepts this love and grace for themselves and learns to give it away to others as, they, as freely as they have received it. We are the second Eve. She is our destiny. We may not be there now. We're full of sin and brokenness still. We're working things out. But because that gate to the garden has been smashed, we are already tasting the first fruits of eternal life, which tells us that we may not work things out completely and become that glorious expression of the second Eve as fully as Jesus was a full expression of the second Adam. But God, Jesus, and us have eternity to work these things out. We are meant to be the bride of Christ. It's a story told in its glory on Easter Sunday. Because Christ is risen. Because Christ is risen. Amen.
Please join me in the call to prayer. In forgiving past grudges, in unlocking unwept tears. In transforming buried anger, in abandoning guilt and fear. In the melting of the ice in our heart, in the giving of our being to God. Let us pray. Sustaining and redeeming Jesus, Spirit of the living Christ. On this day, we celebrate the opening of a new door, the opening of the Easter door for a new life. Opens up the possibilities that are endless. And through the threshold of that door, Jesus, you have come into our lives. We thank you. On this Easter morning, it is Easter here on Paso Grove Beach, but it is Easter around the world. And we are united on this day, regardless of our traditions, regardless of what separates us around the world and every nation, Christians and believers and seekers are all taking a look at the risen Christ. It is Easter in Ukraine, in between the bombs and the crumbling cities. It is Easter in Gaza. And as humanitarian aid is sought to reach the many hands that need it. It is Easter and those that work for peace and those that labor with love so that others might receive, so that this world might become a better place. May it be Easter in our hearts, O God. May you transform ourselves so that we might know of the risen Christ within our very lives in our homes, our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, that regardless of the political divides, regardless of the economic separations between those that have and those that don't, regardless of the languages that might separate us, the coming of the cosmic Christ is a reality. For the Christ, it's something that we hold deep inside. It is that spark, oh God, that you planted within each and every one of us. Come alive today. And so we sing hallelujah, praise the Lord, because our lives have seen a new glimpse of God's glory. We could put aside all the pain and the regrets and the resentments we could put aside all those things that keep us focused on what we have lost. We may have lost money. We may have lost love. We may have lost relationships. We may have lost things and stuff and objects. But with Jesus, we gain more than just eternal life. We gain a new way of looking at today with hope and promise. It is this hope and promise, oh God, that we pray for because we need it. We need it desperately. It is a hope and promise for all that needs to change, all the wrongs that need to be made right, for the many hands that are occupied with apathy to become activated in the work of the church. And so on this day, may the power of the risen Christ be with each and every one of us in such a way that we go outward into the community, into the rest of the week, 
into the remainder of the year as Easter people, as people who know how to proclaim Jesus risen. And let us do so with love. Let us do so with tenderness. Let us extend grace so that grace might be given to us as well. Let us forgive. Let's not for, forget how much we have already been forgiven. And let us do all these things in such a way that it promotes joy. Help us, O oh God, to become your people, Easter people, remembering the words of Jesus who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And yes, it is one of those days where those who say trespass tends to bump up with those who say debts. But it is one of those days where we know that it's all good. It is all good. At, as it was said earlier at the sunrise service, at the base of the cross is the common ground of the Christ. And together we come together to, to make this world a better place. And that is why we ask you to give. We ask you to give so that in your giving, you transform others. In your giving, you also transform yourselves. It is a statement of faith that on this day, because you believe in the, believe in the risen Christ, you give. We recognize how much we have been given. We recognize the abundance in our own lives and that from our discretionary pool of money, we give knowing that for some other people, that is all they will ever receive. The many ministries of this church are ministries that are done with love. And we have to give a shout out to the many people who labor on behalf of the church, not just throughout the year, but on this day as well, to make this day possible. So many hands and so many people came together. We offer words of thanksgiving to them. Won't you please also consider your giving a form of gratitude. Gratitude that is given with a smile and not with grumpiness. Gratitude that is given with joyfulness and all in the name of Jesus. If you are living in the 2020s and you would like to give your offering in a digital and modern way, we do have Venmo. You can give through Venmo or through a QR code. It is printed in the bulletin for your availability. Will the ushers please come forward now to receive the Easter offering?
Will you join me in the prayer of thanksgiving? It is a good and joyful thing to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. As your people, we boldly declare the risen Christ as our savior. Called to a new level of freedom and wholeness, we are grateful for the uniting power of Easter, binding us to one another and to the world. May our gifts as people of the risen Christ be spread through the community and beyond. Amen. Now I invite you to remain seated at first for our uh, closing hymn and wait further on instruction. invite you to be seated for the blessing uh, and for the postlude, which is very special this morning. But before offering it, I just want to note that if you'd like a copy of today's sermon, there are lots of copies available on the kiosk as you exit the sanctuary or on the kiosk as you enter the, uh, as you ask the office uh, entrance to the church as well. Uh, and now please accept our final blessing. Friends, may the Spirit the Holy Spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully as Christians in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself, go beneath you to uphold you and uplift you, go beside you to be your strong and constant companion, and dwell within you 
to remind you that you are surely not alone on this journey and you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you and through you now and always. Amen.
Mr. 